Welcome back. We're going to continue with the review of another paper by Maria Kazevnikov entitled Beyond Mindfulness. Okay, continuing here with this paper, Beyond Mindfulness. Okay, here we are, Beyond Mindfulness, Arousal-Driven Modulation of attentional control during arousal-based practices. Now, Kazevnikov in this paper uh, is following up on a very early uh, research paper that was published in Hindawi, which is not a very credible uh, journal entitled Influence of Buddhist Meditation Tradition on the Autonomic System and Attention. So this was a, the earliest paper where Ido Amihai and Maria Kozevnikov were theorizing that there are other categories of meditation that have different neural correlates. Now, there was not so much data to support their hypothesis uh, in this early paper. But we can see the roots of their inquiry were just simply noting that not all meditation practices are the same. And so they're really focusing on what's called tantric and non-tantric mahamudra. Now, tantric mahamudra uh, is an important concept as we start to look at the uh, traditional practice of visualization and meditation, because uh, according to Kazevnikov, there are different neural correlates or signatures for this quality of wakefulness, attentiveness, but also non-dual awareness, which is referred to in the literature as Mahamudra. But when it is performed after visualizing. In other words, there's a structure to traditional tumo practice, as well as tantric meditation. Tantric meditation has two stages. Again, the generation stage and the completion phase. And the completion phase or the completion stage also has two categories. They are the completion phase with characteristics, which is visualization, and those without characteristics, which is implied Mahamudra. And here, there are two types. Again, non-tantric Mahamudra, which we call Sutra Mahamudra, which involves, in part, resting in non-conceptual awareness in the beginning and being able to establish this state of awareness and abide. And the other type of meditation is called Tantric Mahamudra, or the completion phase with characteristics. And the question is, is there a difference between this embodied state, which may have more of an arousal or activated quality to it, where our attention is very sharp, but this space of non-dual awareness arises after we dissolve our meditation. So again, Kazevnikov in her two or three studies start to look at what is this state of mind or this embodied state of mind in which one rests versus when one engages in visualization practice and then dissolves and rests, because that's the key point. It gets right to the key point of tumo in context. What is this? This is the big question in Tantra, the relationship between this co-emergent wisdom or sahaja, 
that arises when one engages in this somatic practice of tumo and then dissolves and rests in emptiness. So Kazepnikov is saying there are likely different categories of meditation, different types of meditation, and within tantric practice, the neural correlates seem to show that there is a difference between this deep resting without visualization and this deep resting after visualization, as well as after practicing tumo, dissolving the visualization and resting. And again, we'll bring to mind, what does this have to do with health and healing? So we'll go through uh, a couple of slides that are drawn directly from this research article. And he will read both the Yidam, the meditational deity, and Tumo develop the state of PNS withdrawal or an arousal state and phasic alertness as reflected by HFHRV decreases and alpha-2 power increases. So as we get through some of the areas of this article, uh, we'll start to see what is happening with our physiology and those systems tied to attention. Now again, this article on taxonomies of meditation begin to explore these differences in modalities or methodologies. Scientific research on meditation has not differentiated between arousal-based and mindfulness-related practices, treating all meditations as involving tonic alertness and the same type of attentional control related to monitoring the content of mental experiences. So it's important because a lot of the research on mindfulness you'll see uh, talks about the salience system and the insula and how the body notes that which is of importance and brings this up in our experience and how our attentional systems can bring them into awareness and then also let go allowing us to remain present and embodied and not reactive this is an initial focus of mindfulness creating this decentering as we speak about in psychology or this space and distance from reactivity now we're going to discuss phasic alertness and tonic arousal in our sections on embodied meditation especially mindfulness and concentration this is a, a something to keep in mind uh, with regard to the findings of this research the differentiations around the types of meditation that are being studied and again uh, here they're quoting jamgong kongtro traditional scholar Rime scholar who is dividing the completion stage into completion phase with signs or characteristics again that is tantric practice and visualization ritual mantra chanting and completion stage without signs which refers to mahamudra Now, here the authors state within the Vajrayana context, however, tantric Mahamudra is always performed after a generation stage practice. So they are saying that resting in awareness after visualiz visualization in the generation stage, one rests in non-dual awareness. Here discussed this tantric Mahamudra. Here's their hypothesis. We expected Tumo to generate significantly higher arousal than Idam, visualization, as it involves not only visualization, but also vigorous breathing. So does holding the vase and visualizing at the same time create a different effect on the brain and nervous system from holding the breath alone or just these somatic components alone remember the 
components from a research perspective use the constructs of somatic components of posture and breath and neurocognitive visualization and internalized attention. So in this study, you can see how they uh, broke down the methodology. At the beginning of each session, participants staff 15 minutes of rest and were simply seated and relaxing. After 15 minutes, they engaged in non-dual awareness practice or non-tantric Mahamudra. They took a short break and then practiced 15 minutes of visualization or yudam practice and then dissolve that visualization into resting in non-dual awareness. And then another group or those who were trained in Tumo did another 15 minutes of forceful breathing and visualization. Now here we're going to discuss uh, traditional constructs. Tumo is a completion stage practice. And then in this study, that which created the greatest amount of arousal, core body temperature increase and prolonged apnea or breath retention was forceful vase breathing followed by gentle vase breathing. This is how they conceptualized and they spoke to one of the uh, retreat masters in Bhutan. So there is some basis for what they are expressing, though traditional practice does not by and large follow this structure of practice. But the point being here is they emphasize that the dynamic or forceful breath called drak lung was employed in the beginning it did bring about uh, more core body temperature increase and then to prolong that uh, gentle breathing with visualization so this is also what they theorized that visualization uh, maintains these physiological effects and modulates arousal so we enter into practice and we uh, clear the stale breath. We engage in the forceful vase. And then we use gentle vase breath in conjunction with visualization to achieve the aim of practice. Again, there are the process of internal uh, progression in Tumo called the Chatur Ananda in Sanskrit, Chatur Ananda, which is the four blisses. And this really uh, is important to understand because Tumo is not about increase in core body temperature. Now we know from the research uh, that's coming out from the Wim Hof method, they're looking at immunomodulatory effects of sympathetic arousal or activation, cold exposure, apnea or breath retention practices, and how that might impact immune function. But here getting back to Tumo in context of traditional practice, resting before, Completion stage with signs, visualization, forceful breathing, and then a sequential uh, visual visualization sequence followed by a dissolution phase where you rest. Now, again, these are called arousal based practices in Kazevnikov's studies. And Using systematic approaches to produce increasingly higher arousal, Vajrayana practitioners thus seem to be in control of their sympathoadrenal system. Self-identifying oneself with a powerful deity, wearing garlands of skulls and stepping on corpses leads to arousal with higher levels of arousal achieved by visualiz visualizing oneself as a more wrathful deity. Now, the, in the Anuttara Yoga Tantra, 
There are specific types of deities, sometimes even deities in union or semi-wrathful. I want you to just take a moment and see if you concur with this hypothesis, what you know about tantric visualization, and then this intersection of potential impacts on the sympathoadrenal system or the corticoadrenal system. And when we think about stress regulation, this becomes a really important construct. Heightened arousal through Vaz breath over Yidam meditation. According to our results, Tantric Mahamudra does not produce arousal by itself, but it's performed in a state of arousal achieved by Edom. So I'm, I'm bringing attention to processes that are usually not uh, looked at so closely. And so this is something I appreciate about this study design, although I believe it's very limited in what it's uh, studying the structure of tumor practice. So this is the most important uh, takeaway from all three of these studies that I want to emphasize. Start to contextualize somatic practices, both how uh, skillfully engaged in, how you apply the visualization instruction, that there is a sequence, you know, if this... Uh, researchers is looking at taxonomies and these arousal mechanisms and attention systems, then mapping out a structure of practice is very important in terms of regulation. And this is uh, where we're going in terms of embodied practices such as Salong Chulkor and also the root practice, Tumo. What does Tumo practice uh, give access to in terms of input, experiential input for the body. How do we maintain mindfulness, a sense of embodiment during difficult or high arousal states? This is a primary question. And also uh, what is not yet alluded to, which is an uh, essential to understanding Tumo, is the place of joy, embodied compassion, positive affective states. This is where we're going to, in terms of the transformative nature of mind-body practice in Vajrayana. So there's different ways that we attend to phenomena in the body how attentive, how awake, how present, what does each method uh, give access to? If we are guided to pay attention, moment-to-moment -moment awareness, through the framework of the Satipatthana, mindfulness-based practices, how does it differ from this very complex syncretic practice of Vajrayana meditation. Concentration, mindfulness begets insight. There are pro-social meditations which cultivate loving kindness, joy, compassion. How do these differ from what is called de dewa? Mitokpa, non-conceptuality, thought-free awareness, bliss and joy in the body, and also clarity or luminosity. These cognitive, affective traits and states are explored differently, and there are unique characteristics of Vajrayana meditation, both in terms of the structure which is the set and setting, how you move into a practice and how you step out. If you're practicing shikantaza or zazen, how does the view now uh, it might become clear 
that our cognitive appraisals and our explanatory models support a certain type of experience. If we were to look rationally, if we looked at a cause of illness, a imbalance or pathology in a process, and then a therapeutic, we call it chikitsa, rationale and intervention. If we look at a meditation practice where we see inattention, for example, if it's inattentiveness, attention deficit, uh, how might a concentration practice be difficult or beneficial? And what about an embodied somatic practice? If it's difficult to uh, just rest and stay attentive to mental processes, how does contacting the body improve cognition, shift behavior, and also improve attentional skills, improve attentional skills? And what might be uh, some of the aspects of attention, intention, intentionality, and also some of these other methodologies like visualization, how do these components lend to a therapeutic benefit? Now, again, if we look at Rich, uh, Richie Davidson's paper, uh, there, along with visualization, there is the notion of shifting internal schemas. So how these meditation practices uh, give rise to certain experiences of self of health or embodiment, uh, I think we'll find something um, unique about Vajrayana meditation, especially embodied practices like Tumo and Tibetan Yoga. So we'll go through some of these fine points. Some of them are less uh, important unless you're focused on the science, the neuroscience. So while Yidam and Tumo aim to strengthen top-down control, I really want to touch upon this. Is it top-down control when you are maintaining the breath and employing a visualization instruction, like visualizing a red, hot, ah, or syllable, or finger was below and behind the navel, or is it top-down control when the whole body is visualized in terms of channels and winds and essences? How does top-down, uh, we'll have to explain what this top-down control means. Um, in this context, but how do these specific meditation approaches differ? So while Yidam and Tumo aim to strengthen top-down control, Mahamudra, either tantric or non-tantric Mahamudra, aims to reduce it. So we see this uh, polarity between effort and effortlessness, a practice that involves such a high degree of control of affect and energy, activation and that resolves into a state of non-dual awareness. So we want to look at what is happening with the brain, the nervous system, and also the energetic system. So again, this question arises, what is the relationship between tantric and non-tantric Mahamudra and Tumo. So I would like us to pause and whatever somatic practice you engage in, internal martial arts, dance, qigong, yoga, yoga therapy, that which you have the most experience with. Describe in your own terms what are these processes of change and insight embodied transformative 
experiences that you cultivate but that makes these practices healing, integrative, and promoting greater embodiment for you. Because this is also about a state of attention, awareness, but also physiological regulation. So in the later segments, we will discuss the neuroscience around bottom-up and top-down processes of healing, which also um, are, are addressed in different contemplative psychotherapy modalities. So top-down and bottom-up regulation. 